This episode involves discussions about the sexual abuse of minors and fetal abduction. Please use discretion before listening. The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Murderish podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Listener discretion is advised. On December 17, 2004, 39-year-old Lisa Montgomery showed off her newborn baby around her small Kansas town. Like any new mom, she felt great pride to have her wide-eyed baby fawned over and admired. But this wasn't an ordinary pregnancy. Nobody could recall Lisa with a swollen belly on the verge of bringing a child into the world. When she showed everyone her baby for the first time, something seemed off. This curiosity sparked a deep dive into Lisa's past, and what was discovered shocked and disturbed everyone. This is Jamie, and you're listening to Murderish. Join me as I walk you through the case of Lisa Montgomery. The case takes us to Melvern, Kansas, which is located in Osage County, roughly 40 miles south of Topeka. The rural community has less than 400 people living there, according to the 2010 census. As is the case in many small Midwest towns, people who live in Melvern are descendants of working-class citizens. The town's residents are pretty well-connected, and most people know their neighbor's business, gossip, and camaraderie tend to go hand-in-hand in in the town. Lisa Montgomery lived in many different places from childhood into adulthood, including Washington State, Kansas, Colorado, Oklahoma, California, and Texas. She was born in Pierce County, Washington, on February 27, 1968. Her father, John Patterson, was a decorated Vietnam War veteran who had a child from a previous marriage. Lisa and her half-sister, Diane, always had a close relationship. While the girls shared a father, Lisa's mother, Judy, was on her second marriage when she wed John. To say that Judy was cruel would be a drastic understatement. With John frequently away on business trips, Judy took her frustrations and dissatisfaction out on Lisa and Diane. According to the Kansas City Star editorial board, she punished the girls by making them eat raw onions, sending them outdoors naked on cold winter days, and beating them with brooms and belts. Judy also had a drinking problem. She often left the young sisters alone with older men who acted as impromptu babysitters while she went out to a local bar. Some of these strangers sexually abused Diane on several occasions. In 1971, when Diane was eight and Lisa was four, Judy and John divorced. Despite the abuse, Judy kept custody of Lisa since her father had moved overseas. The mother and daughter moved into a mobile home in Ogden, Kansas for a short time. Judy was not related to Diane by blood so the young girl ended up in the foster care system for a time before being returned to Judy. Then, the state of Kansas intervened and placed her in a permanent foster home. It isn't clear why the state did not also remove Lisa from Judy's care. Being separated from her half-sister left Lisa traumatized. She was terrified of what her mother would do without Diane around to protect her and her concerns were not unfounded. Shockingly, Judy began selling her young daughter's body in exchange for services from repairmen who worked on the house. Eventually, Judy moved on to her second marriage in 1974. Jack Kleiner was a divorced father of five who also drank heavily. He was physically abusive to both his wife and their children, beating them with belts, cords, hangers, and his own two fists. The laundry list of abusive acts endured by Lisa and her half-siblings culminated in Judy killing the family dog right in front of them. 
the unthinkable abuse did not stop there. Not for Lisa, anyway. At age 14, she was frequently sexually assaulted by her stepdad and his friends. Though Kleiner maintained his innocence up until his death in 2009. After graduating from high school in Cleveland, Oklahoma in 1986, Lisa became pregnant with her stepbrother Carl's child. He was the son of Judy's third husband. They quickly married and went on to have two daughters and a son between 1987 and 1990. All of the horrifying events Lisa had witnessed during her mother's time being married to six different men exemplified how relationships could be volatile, abusive, and dysfunctional. Perhaps it's not surprising that Carl and Lisa's marriage had major issues as well. Carl frequently assaulted and raped Lisa, even going so far as capturing the attacks on video. They eventually divorced, only to remarry and divorce again in 1998. Over the years, Lisa's half-sister Diane tried to track her down so they could reconnect. This proved nearly impossible as Lisa had moved over 16 times since the girls were separated. The following year, Lisa met her second husband, Kevin Montgomery. Kevin lived in Melbourne, Kansas, and worked as an electrician at Acme Sign Incorporated in Kansas City, Missouri. Five days a week, Kevin made the 70-mile commute from his desolate town into the bustling city. To Lisa, Kevin was everything her ex-husband was not. He was hardworking, a devoted father, and a supportive husband. Although Kevin had been married once before, his three children lived with their mother. He and Lisa married in 2000. By that point, Lisa's three daughters were teenagers and attended the local high school in Malvern. Though they lived with Lisa and Kevin, they were usually out socializing. Lisa's youngest child lived in Alabama with extended family. In October of 2001, Lisa announced she was pregnant. It was a joyous occasion, despite Kevin being entangled in a heated custody dispute with his ex-wife. A few months into her pregnancy, Lisa told Melvern townspeople she had suffered a miscarriage. After their heartbreaking loss, The couple took a break from trying to conceive, and for a while, they focused on their shared love of dogs, specifically rat terriers. That's how Lisa became acquainted with a woman named Bobby Jo Stinnett, a 23-year-old rat terrier breeder from Skidmore, Missouri, who owned a business called Happy Haven Farms. Lisa and Bobby Jo initially met at dog shows in the Kansas City area. They stayed in touch on Ratter Chatter an online message board for rat terrier enthusiasts. But Bobby Joe only knew Lisa Montgomery by her alias, Darlene Fisher. Records would later indicate the women had known each other for at least a year and had met in person twice before. Lisa never seemed to settle on a career path. An anonymous former employer told the Hayes Daily News that Lisa had juggled three jobs at one point, working for a contractor who managed a Greyhound Lines bus stop in Topeka, at a local Wendy's fast food restaurant, and at a gas station as an attendant. In November of 2003, Lisa again announced that she was pregnant, and then she stopped working. On the message board, she spoke about how difficult it was to care for the dogs while being very pregnant. But again, no birth occurred. It's possible that Melvern residents and Lisa's online contacts just assumed that she had another miscarriage and they were too polite to ask. In mid-April of 2004, Bobby Joe shared the news that she was pregnant with her first child. She and her husband, Zeb, had been high school sweethearts and were married for less than two years before they conceived. Shortly after Bobby Joe's announcement, Lisa stated that she was also pregnant, saying she was about a month along. Throughout their pregnancies, Bobby Joe and Lisa remained in contact casually via message forum posts. Then, on December 15th, under the screen name Fisher for Kids, 
Lisa started a message chain addressed to Bobby Joe. In the message, she said her name was Darlene. According to the New York Daily News, she wrote, I was recommended to you and have been unable to reach you by either phone or email. Please get in touch with me soon, as we are considering the purchase of one of your puppies and would like to ask you a few questions. Several hours later, Bobby Joe responded, not knowing that she was actually corresponding with Lisa Montgomery. Bobby Joe said in her response that she had emailed directions to her home so they could meet to discuss the puppy. As far as she knew, Darlene lived in Fairfax, Missouri, a town neighboring Skidmore. She responded to Darlene's message with, I do hope that the email reaches you. Great chatting with you on Messenger. Lisa did receive Bobby Joe's email and confirmed the meeting with her under the alias. Around mid-morning on December 16, 2004, Lisa made her way from Melvern, Kansas to Skidmore, Missouri. It was a a two-and-a-half-hour drive without traffic. The meeting was set up under the guise that a woman named Darlene wanted to buy a rat terrier puppy from a recent litter as a Christmas gift. Bobby Joe told her husband and mother about the arrangement. Lisa arrived in Skidmore just after noon that day, while Bobby Joe's husband was still at work. Unbeknownst to her, the woman with a fake name carried a sharp kitchen knife and a white cord in her jacket pocket. When Lisa pulled up in her disheveled red Toyota, Bobby Joe greeted the woman she believed to be Darlene, a horde of rat terriers trailing behind her. Bobby Joe only knew this woman by her alias. Lisa had never revealed her true identity. The women chatted casually, playing with the puppies for a while, until Bobby Joe received a call from her mother at around 2.30 p.m. She was confirming that Bobby Joe would pick her up from work later that afternoon. That was the last time anyone would hear from the pregnant woman again. I've been telling you about Stamps.com because I know everyone is into saving money and time. With Stamps.com, you can ship packages via USPS or UPS anywhere you want without stepping foot outside your house or office. Yesterday, I shipped about 20 packages to Murderish Patreon subscribers using my Stamps account and I saved myself a trip to the post office. With the time I saved, I was able to squeeze in a workout. What will you do with the time you save? Small business owners and Etsy shop owners, Stamps.com is perfect for you because it literally brings the post office to you so you can spend time running and growing your business. Enjoy up to 40% off post office rates and up to 66% off UPS shipping rates with your Stamps.com account. Just print postage right from your home or office printer like a boss and get on with your day. Stamps.com is a no-brainer. Time and money savings, enough said. Stop wasting time going to the post office and go to stamps.com instead. There's no risk, and with my promo code MURDERISH, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in MURDERISH. That's stamps.com, promo code MURDERISH, Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Ladies, have you ever heard of dress pants that don't wrinkle easily, hold their shape all day, don't dig into your sides, look great, and feel like a pair of yoga pants? Beta Brand has created the perfect office-appropriate pants that are all the things I mentioned. I've worn my Beta Brand dress pant yoga pants for months now, and they are the best. I've worn them to the office, to a funeral, and out on a date night. They always make me feel so good because the fit is perfect and they pair with just about any top. With Beta Brand Dress Pant Yoga Pants, I don't have to choose between looking great or feeling comfortable. On their website, Beta Brand has so many different styles, colors, and fits to choose from. 
And they recently came out with Soho joggers, and they're awesome. Beta Brand launches new styles weekly, keeping their pieces fresh and on trend. Right now, my listeners can get 30% off your first Beta Brand order when you go to betabrand.com slash murderish. That's 30% off your first order for a limited time at betabrand.com slash murderish. Find out why women are ditching typical work pants for Beta Brand's dress pant yoga pants. Go to betabrand.com slash murderish for 30% off. Bobby Joe's mother, Becky Harper, anxiously waited outside her workplace for her daughter. She was supposed to pick Becky up from work around 3.30, but never showed, which was extremely out of character for Bobby Joe. Concerned by her daughter's absence and lack of response, Becky walked the two blocks to Bobby Joe's house. She found the door unlocked and called out for her daughter. There was no reply, despite Bobby Joe's car being parked in the driveway. When Becky reached the dining room, she stumbled upon a horrific scene. There she saw her daughter's mangled body lying on the floor in a pool of blood. Her stomach had been cut open. Becky immediately notified authorities. According to the St. Joseph News Press, who referenced the 911 call, Becky told the dispatcher, She is laying on the floor with blood everywhere. She was pregnant. It's like her guts have exploded or something. She also said her daughter wasn't breathing and felt very cold to the touch. The Nottaway County Sheriff at the time, Ben Epsey, was the first emergency responder on the scene. Bobby Joe was quickly determined to already be deceased. Once he observed that the umbilical cord had been severed, Epsey knew he had to mobilize an investigative team immediately. He put the Northwest Missouri Mobile Squad to work. The squad was a network of investigators from several regional law enforcement agencies. The FBI also got involved to assist in identifying Bobby Joe's killer. Investigators also needed to find out where her baby was. There was still a chance the newborn had survived, and the focus initially was finding the baby girl. As one could imagine, Bobby Joe's death was soul-crushing for her family. According to CNN, she was the third member of the Stinnett family to be murdered within the previous four years. Joanne Stinnett, Bobby Joe's grandmother, shared the details of the string of family tragedies with the New York Daily News. In 2000, her 25-year-old granddaughter, Wendy Gillenwater, was stomped to death by her boyfriend. Then her grandson, 24-year-old Branson Perry, had disappeared in 2001. The case went cold, but authorities suspected foul play. The news of Bobby Joe's brutal murder brought a deeper grief to a family who had already faced so much loss. In speaking of her, Joanne Stinnett told the New York Daily News, She's married to my grandson. She was a wonderful woman. She was the backbone of her family. They say time heals, but it doesn't make you forget. Bobby Joe's husband, Zeb, was completely shattered by the loss of his wife. He told the St. Joseph News Press, It's devastated my life. My world just crashed to an end. A private funeral was held for Bobby Joe in Merrillville, Missouri, and then she was laid to rest in her hometown of Skidmore. Most of the town's residents, around 300 people, attended her service. Tragically, the same pastor who had married Zeb and Bobby Joe a little over a year before had to deliver her eulogy. Nancy Strudel, who was a trainer in the Rat Terrier dog show circuit, got to know Bobby Joe very well. She told ABC's Good Morning America, Bobby Joe was a real shy lady, but real sweet and wouldn't hurt anybody or anything. Very trusting, but very intelligent. As for the Ratter Chatter online community, they put the pieces together before anyone else, even investigators. Together, members realized that Darlene had arranged to meet with Bobby Joe on the day she was killed. They knew this because the women's meeting arrangements had been made publicly 
through posts within the chat forum. An anonymous poster wrote, We saw a murder plan in front of us, and it makes me so sad. By doing their own web sleuthing, the Rab Chatter online community members were able to analyze Darlene's IP address and trace it to Kansas. This revelation compelled members of the message board to contact state police with their information. By 8 a.m. the day after Bobby Joe was killed, half a dozen tips had been called in by online users. Sergeant Investigator Randy Strong, who would later become the Nottoway County Sheriff, led the investigation. His home base was Merrillville, Missouri, which is 14 miles northeast of Skidmore. Don Fritz, who hailed from the Cameron, Missouri Police Department, also led the multi-agency team. What initially bewildered detectives was that there were no signs of a forced entry at Zeb and Bobby Joe Stinnett's home. They took the leads about a woman named Darlene Fisher seriously, but after pulling in all their resources, they couldn't find anyone by that name in Kansas. As Detective Strong told the St. Joseph News Press, we became very suspicious then that we had a fake name. Early in the investigation, law enforcement believed that issuing an Amber Alert was crucial. It would put eyes in more places to look out for the missing baby. However, this was an unusual circumstance, as it dealt with what had previously been an unborn child. Unfortunately, the criteria needed for an Amber Alert, such as a physical description of the baby, could not be met given that nobody had ever seen her. The FBI sought the endorsement of U.S. Congressman Sam Graves, who was able to issue a more generic alert. As Detective Strong told the St. Joe News Press, there was no protocol for an unseen newborn. All we knew was that the fetus was removed. The investigation leaned heavily on the online rat terrier group. By combing through posts that dated back to over a year prior, detectives were able to outline details associated with the Darlene Fisher alias. Records from a dog show in April of 2004 as well as photographs confirmed when Lisa Montgomery, Bobby Joe, and trainer Nancy Strudel had first met. Nancy Strudel spoke with investigators about Lisa Montgomery's pregnancies. At one point, she said that Lisa told the dog show community she was pregnant with twins, but later on the message board, Lisa claimed that she had lost one baby but was able to keep the other. Nancy told the Kansas City Star, She was skinny as a rail, and she never gained an ounce. None of the Rat Terrier people believed she was pregnant. Melvern residents evidently had the same incredulous outlook on Lisa's pregnancies. Lisa's pastor, Rev. Mike Wheatley of the First Church of God, told the Kansas City Star they wanted to have their own child desperately. She said she would be attached at the hip to Kevin. There was a desperation there. The Reverend had seen Lisa in October of that year, who claimed to be eight months pregnant at the time. When Wheatley remarked that Lisa looked too thin to be that far along, Lisa said she always had small babies. The day before the crime, Lisa and Bobby Joe had emailed outside of the online group to solidify plans to meet. Detectives were able to trace the last email sent by Lisa under the alias Darlene to a computer at the Montgomery residence. They had also received reports that Lisa was showing off her new baby around town. Investigators learned that the morning after the crime, Lisa behaved like a new mom. According to the New York Daily News, she had taken the infant to her pastor for his blessing, had given the older children photos to take to school, and she had shown off the baby at a local diner, the Whistle Stop Cafe. The diner owner, Kathy Safe, told the newspaper, I was irate. You don't bring a newborn baby out in public. Others reacted by saying they had no idea that Lisa was pregnant. By the afternoon of December 18th, Detectives Fritz and Strong were ready to knock on Lisa's door. When they arrived, Kevin Montgomery answered the door. By going to Lisa's home, Detectives hoped to identify potential witnesses. Instead, 
they found Lisa sitting on the couch with a newborn baby in her arms, watching TV while the nationwide Amber Alert ironically flashed across the screen. Lisa told investigators she had given birth to her daughter, Abigail, the day before. She said her water broke while she was out Christmas shopping and that she had called her husband to pick her up from a birthing center in Topeka. Detective Strong asked Kevin for discharge papers, but after going out to his truck to retrieve them, he came back inside empty-handed. Detective Strong examined the infant and knew this was the abducted child. He told the St. Joe News Press, you could tell that the shape of the baby's head looked like a cesarean birth. The color was good, but probably the thing that bothered me the most was the fact that the baby didn't cry. While interacting with Lisa, Detective Fritz was preoccupied, taking note of details like Lisa's fingernails. When he shook her hand, Fritz observed dried blood and what appeared to be tissue embedded beneath her nails. The baby was handed off to an FBI agent and later taken to a hospital for evaluation. While Lisa maintained that she had given birth the day before, detectives decided to separate her from her husband to see if she would change her story. They took Lisa to a nearby undercover narcotics facility and questioned her, using a good cop, bad cop approach. At first, she said she had given birth in Topeka. Then, she said she had given birth at home with the assistance of two female friends. Then, The story evolved into her stating that she gave birth alone. There were glaring inconsistencies with Lisa's account of events. After hours of grueling interrogation, Lisa finally confessed, telling detectives that the baby belonged to Bobby Joe. She was immediately taken into police custody. Here in Southern California, we're feeling the weather change from cool to warm. During the winter, I was wearing my Jenny Kane Shearling Slides, the shoe that started it all with so many different outfits. With the warmer weather, I'm still wearing them several times a week. They are so versatile and beyond cute. I can't count how many times I've browsed the Jenny Kane website over the last few weeks because their pieces are so stylish and easy to pair with just about anything. Jenny Kane sweaters are amazing. You can wear them on a cozy night in or on a girl's night out. With their California cool vibe and polished basics, Jenny Kane pieces will never go out of style. Jenny Kane believes that getting dressed should be the easiest part of your daily routine, and their pieces exemplify this. You don't have to overthink your outfit for the day with Jenny Kane. Find your forever pieces at JennyKane.com and get 15% off your first order when you use code MURDERISH at checkout. That's J-E-N-N-I-K-E-Y-N-E.com, promo code MURDERISH. Crime is so commonplace that it takes something particularly shocking and horrifying to be labeled the crime of the century. Even so, Many of these crimes have been forgotten or lost to history. Until now, Crimes of the Centuries is a new true crime podcast from award-winning reporter Amber Hunt and the Obsessed Network. Each week, Amber takes a deep dive into one of these crimes, telling forgotten true crime tales that you've likely never heard of before. Episodes include a 220-year-old murder, that brought together Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr as lawyers for the defense. Also, Jazz Age thrill killers, a murdering grandmother, serial killers you've never heard of, and so many more. Crimes of the Centuries rediscovers the true crime stories that shocked the nation. Cases so unbelievable that we thought we'd never forget them, but somehow we did. Until now. Hear these stories right now by finding and subscribing to Crimes of the Centuries, Wherever you get your podcasts, now enjoy a promo for Crimes of the Centuries. Sometimes a case comes along that is so heinous, so shocking, that it's called the crime of the century. 
Truth is, though, there have been a lot of those cases over the years. I'm Amber Hunt, an award-winning journalist and author, with a new podcast that marries true crime with history. It's called Crimes of the Centuries from the Obsessed Network. I'm examining stories that left a mark. Some of them are first of their kind, like the country's first recorded murder trial or first kidnapping for ransom. Crimes of the Centuries will explore not just the crimes that were committed, but what was happening in the world at that time and what effects they had on society that we may still notice today. Subscribe to Crimes of the Centuries from the Obsessed Network on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your shows. Although she had admitted to kidnapping, Lisa tried to lay the blame for the murder on her half-brother, Tommy Kleiner. But he had a solid alibi. He was meeting with his parole officer at the time Bobby Joe was killed. Detective Strong would later comment to the Topeka Capital Journal, That's how evil this woman is. She tried to throw her own brother under the bus for a crime that she committed. Kevin Montgomery, Lisa's husband, had been a victim too. Reverend Michael Wheatley conveyed deep sympathy for Kevin, stating publicly that his heart broke for him. He told the New York Daily News he's proud one moment and his wife is arrested the next. At a December 20th hearing, Deputy U.S. Attorney for the District Court in Kansas City, Matt Whitworth, asked a judge to keep Lisa in custody. As reported in the Kansas City Star, Whitworth argued that Lisa was a danger to the community and a flight risk. This case involves an act of extreme violence. Further, the defendant is now charged with the offense of kidnapping, resulting in death, which carries a maximum sentence of life without parole or death. The judge agreed, and Lisa was held without bail at the Nottoway County Jail. In the meantime, prosecutors mounted even more damning evidence against her. Lisa Montgomery's trial began in October 2007, spanning 11 days. The nation was captivated by the case and eagerly anticipating the trial. Because the crime had been committed in Missouri, it was held at the federal court in Kansas City, where six men and six women were chosen to be on the jury. Opening statements by Lisa's defense team, Chandra Babcock and Fred Duchard, told the jury that their client was pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. This was their best chance. At that point, Lisa had already confessed to the murder and fetal abduction. According to Rolling Stone, Duchard has the dubious distinction of being the only trial lawyer to have multiple clients executed on death row. Duchard also disregarded the American Bar Association's guidelines, stating a defense attorney must work with a mitigation specialist who delves into the defendant's background which includes mental illness, trauma, and anything that can help the jury understand the defendant as a full human. This oversight likely undermined any arguments in favor of Lisa's defense. Federal prosecutors David Baird and Assistant U.S. Attorney Matt Whitworth honed in on Lisa's history of fake pregnancies, as well as the barbaric manner in which the victim had been killed. Kevin Montgomery, Lisa's husband, was among the first to testify at trial. He walked the courtroom through three occasions when his wife had claimed she was with child. With the first pregnancy after they were married, Lisa told her husband she was going to New Mexico to have an abortion. Lisa claimed her second pregnancy didn't produce a child because there had been something wrong with the baby, so she had donated the baby's body to science. According to the Springfield News Leader, During Lisa's third alleged pregnancy in the spring of 2004, Kevin testified that one of Lisa's relatives had reached out to him. This unknown individual told Kevin that Lisa was unable to have any more children because she had undergone a tubal ligation in 1990, which means that she had her tubes tied. Kevin had never been informed of this procedure and admitted He didn't know what the term tubal ligation meant. 
He wanted to believe the woman he loved, so at the time, he took the information with a grain of salt. Kevin also added that he was frustrated that Lisa had told him not to accompany her to her prenatal appointments. He said he had no reason to doubt she was pregnant. On the witness stand, Kevin stressed his lack of involvement or any knowledge of his wife's vile scheme. He had been tricked as much as anyone into believing that Lisa was pregnant. Kevin's ex-wife, Lori Colwell, also testified, saying that when she heard of Lisa's pregnancy in 2004, her reaction was, here we go again, I didn't believe her. She told the jury that Kevin is easily manipulated and has poor social skills. Lori had been the one who persuaded Kevin to accompany Lisa to a doctor's appointment to check if she was actually pregnant but Lisa kept canceling the appointments. Then, Lisa's ex-husband, Carl Bowman, took the stand. He spoke about the tubal ligation procedure Lisa had undergone. According to the Manhattan Mercury, Lisa's doctor had recommended the procedure after their fourth child was born, more than two months premature. The physician was concerned that Lisa would be unable to carry another pregnancy to term. When Lisa announced her third pregnancy in 2004 with Kevin, Carl admitted to threatening Lisa. As captured in the Manhattan Mercury, he admitted on the stand that at the time I told her I was going to expose her lies. He intended to take his former wife to court and use the false pregnancies to acquire custody of the two youngest children. Eerily, on the day before the crime, Lisa's ex-husband claimed to receive a call from her saying, she said she was going to prove me wrong. After all of the testimony regarding Lisa's fake pregnancies, the defense moved on to her struggles with mental illness. Dr. V.S. Ramachandran, director of the Center of Brain and Cognition at the University of California in San Diego, took the witness stand. He introduced the idea of Lisa being afflicted with a disorder known as pseudosiesis. Women who suffer from this disorder exhibit physical symptoms as if they are pregnant when in reality, they aren't. Reportedly, pseudosiesis is common among women with a history of childhood sexual abuse and those who mentally fixate on pregnancy and babies. In addition to pseudosiesis, Dr. Ramachandran testified that Lisa suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder, and major depression. He testified it was likely that Lisa had committed the crime in a disassociative state. As captured by the Topeka Capital Journal, Lisa's defense argued sexual abuse during her childhood had caused Montgomery to become mentally ill and kill her soul. Prosecutors countered by saying, She was faking mental illness, noting that many people are sexually abused, but few go on to kill. Of course, prosecutors emphasized the cold and merciless way Bobby Joe had met her demise. Detective Strong revealed that the investigation had yielded hard facts showing that Lisa had committed the crime. By examining cell phone records, the investigative team was able to pinpoint Lisa's location in the day before the murder. Records showed that she had made a practice run from Melvern to Bobby Joe Skidmore's home, a distance of approximately 350 miles. Also, by looking into Lisa's recent internet searches, they saw that she had visited a website featuring a video of a live C-section birth, which certainly did not seem like casual internet browsing. The most difficult moment for the victim's family must have come when coroner Miguel Laboy took the stand. He displayed various graphic photos from the autopsy. The murder weapons had been a steak knife and a clothesline, with the cause of death being exangination. Bobby Joe had bled to death. As documented in the Houston Chronicle, the coroner stated that Bobby Joe had eight jagged cuts across her abdomen as well as two ligature marks around her neck. He also noted defensive wounds present on her hands, face, and elbows. Bobby Joe had fought for her life. St. Louis County Medical Examiner Dr. Mary Case 
told the jury how she imagined the attack unfolded based on the presence of defensive wounds. Dr. Case's testimony was shocking. According to the Houston Chronicle, on the witness stand, the doctor said, The evidence to me shows that she regained consciousness while the incision was made. A struggle ensued and she was strangled again. The second strangulation combined with the extensive blood loss is likely what ended her life. Dr. Case also speculated that the large amount of blood on the bottom of the victim's feet showed that Bobby Joe had her feet flat on the floor when she was cut, either standing or sitting with her knees raised. This theory meant it was highly unlikely the victim had been unconscious when her newborn child was forcibly removed from her womb. As the trial drew to a close, Lisa's defense team spoke again about her current mental illness, but surprisingly glossed over the severity of her childhood traumas. In closing arguments captured by the Topeka Capital Journal, Assistant U.S. Attorney Matt Whitworth implored jurors to think about Victoria Jo Stinnett. Every time she has a birthday, it will also be the anniversary of the slaughter of her mother, every year for the rest of her life. It was a painful reminder of just how much Lisa Montgomery's actions had a ripple effect, impacting an innocent young child who would never know her mother. Today, I'm taking it to the streets to give people the good news. Oh, excuse me, hello. I'm Flo from Progressive, and did you know... No, I'm just waiting for the bus. So then you have time to hear about how with HomeQuote Explorer, you can check if you're paying too much for home insurance. Yeah, if I was interested in talking to you, which I'm not. Okay, I'll do the talking, and you just check if you can be saving, which is going to be pretty hard to do if you... Put on your headphones. Okay. See if you're paying too much for home insurance with Home Quote Explorer. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. From the New York Times best selling author Paula McLean comes a propulsive new mystery a missing girl, a broken woman. The truth is hard to see when the stars go dark. When the stars go dark is available wherever books and audiobooks are sold. Jurors deliberated for less than five hours and unanimously reached a verdict. Lisa Montgomery was found guilty of kidnapping resulting in death. They recommended for Lisa to be sentenced to death for the gruesome crime. According to the court document United States v. Lisa Montgomery, the jury reached this verdict because the government had proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant had committed the crime. They also cited several aggravating factors in favor of capital punishment, one of which was the evidence of substantial planning and premeditation. The jury also asserted that Montgomery had committed the offense in an especially heinous or depraved manner in that the killing involved serious physical abuse to Bobby Joe Stinnett. To the jury and the U.S. court, this warranted the death penalty. Many opponents of the death penalty would come forward in the years following Lisa's sentencing. Her supporters found it unjust how little her attorneys had conveyed about her dysfunctional and abusive childhood and how she continued to suffer from all the horrors she had endured. The baby girl Lisa had stolen was returned to her father, Zeb, who renamed her Victoria Jo. As Becky Harper, Bobby Joe's mother told the Associated Press, The case has finally come to a close. We will never stop missing Bobby Joe. She was a sweet and loving wife, daughter, and sister, and would have been a wonderful mother. Our priority now is Victoria Joe. We want her life as normal as possible. After her sentencing, Lisa Montgomery was sent to the Carswell Federal Medical Center in Fort Worth, Texas which is a federal prison specifically for female inmates with specific medical and mental health needs. Lisa wasn't done fighting. She hired a new legal team to assist her with appeals. The team was led by public defenders Kelly Henry and Army Harwell. From 2012 until 2020, they worked tirelessly to get Lisa's sentence commuted to life in prison. Through a series of interviews, Lisa's new legal team were able to get a full picture of Lisa's damaging upbringing. 
They spoke with social workers, friends, neighbors, and relatives. In a sworn statement, Lisa's cousin, Deputy Sheriff David Kidwell Sr., stated that she had confided in him about the rapes and assaults from her stepfather. When Judy had testified against her own daughter during the sentencing phase, she spoke of the abuse by saying, Lisa tried to steal her husband. Clearly, Judy had no sympathy for her daughter, who suffered sexual abuse at the hands of her husband's. Instead, it was Lisa's fault for trying to take her husband away. Judy's testimony likely gave the court a glimpse into the twisted relationship she had with Lisa. By piecing together Lisa's history of physical and sexual abuse and then consulting medical experts, Henry and her team got a broader sense of how unwell their client truly was. Lisa was also found to have temporal lobe epilepsy, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, disassociative disorder, psychosis, and traumatic brain injury some of which stemmed from her mother drinking throughout her pregnancy. Lisa's lawyers argued in a 2019 appeal that her mental illness made it impossible for their client to understand her sentencing. In a written statement from Lisa's attorneys, as published in the Topeka Capital Journal, read, Lisa's trauma was so severe that it compromised her neurological functioning and development. As a result, Lisa has trouble processing information and navigating social relationships. She struggles to maintain her own hygiene, loses focus during conversations with others, and has trouble planning simple tasks. As it turned out, outlining severe abuse Lisa experienced from an early age would not be enough. All of her appeals for clemency were denied. In July of 2020, the Trump administration reinstated the federal death penalty, which had been on hiatus for nearly two decades. Lisa's execution date was set for December 8, 2020. However, the date was rescheduled as both of her lawyers became severely ill with COVID-19 after traveling to see their client. Additionally, according to the Topeka Capital Journal, Executions themselves are super spreader events because they bring a whole team of outsiders into prison. In the midst of a global pandemic, a judge granted Lisa's attorneys an extension on their clemency petition, delaying the execution. Following Lisa's trial and subsequent sentencing, her sister, Diane Mattingly, had resurfaced. She was and continues to be a strong opponent of the death penalty. Diane had written opinion pieces for Elle and Newsweek regarding her sister. She also released a public statement addressed to Trump. In her plea for clemency, as published in the Topeka Capital Journal, she said, Please don't take my sister. She was broken by people who were supposed to be her caregivers. She needs someone for once in her life to be on her side. A December 2020 article on the Child Welfare Monitor's website drives this point home by listing all of the individuals, authorities, and organizations who failed Lisa Montgomery. The article states that school administrators, relatives, and doctors failed to report the abuse or take any action regarding the abuse. The Child Welfare Monitor comments that it is difficult to understand how so many people in positions of authority knew about Lisa's plight and did not interfere. Lisa's case tells us why we must not eliminate mandatory reporting of child abuse and neglect. Many people cannot help but wonder if maybe someone had intervened, would Bobby Joe Stinnett still be alive today? Though Lisa had her supporters, others adamantly believed she was simply a rotten person. Newspapers in the weeks leading up to the execution offered up editorials which proposed Lisa was inherently evil, not damaged. Lisa was given a new execution date, January 12, 2021. She was transferred to the Federal Correctional Complex in Terre Haute, Indiana, and placed under suicide watch. While awaiting execution, Lisa was the only woman on federal death row. As the date approached, 
death penalty opponents made their voices louder. Missourians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty issued a news release about Lisa. Aside from emphasizing the extent of cruelty inflicted upon her, the organization said Montgomery is one of about a dozen women who have been convicted of similar crimes involving killing pregnant women for their babies in the United States, and she is the only one who has been sentenced to death. The Kansas City Star editorial board shared a similar stance. They said, Opposition to the death penalty has been growing for some time, but even many of those who support it don't think it was ever meant to be used against someone as impaired as Lisa Montgomery. Many people rallied in support of granting Lisa clemency. According to The Intercept, as of January 10, 2021, more than 40 current and former prosecutors support Montgomery's clemency petition, including some who have prosecuted women for similar crimes. Federal Judge Patrick Hanlon thought Lisa's mental competency was worth examining. In the early morning hours of January 12th, Lisa was granted a stay of execution, but the Supreme Court immediately overruled. During this time, it's been reported that former President Donald Trump had a goal to either pardon or execute a slew of inmates before Joe Biden took office. The execution would be moving forward. As Lisa reclined on the gurney, the Associated Press described her as bewildered. Lisa was administered a series of injections intended to paralyze her, stop her heart, and finally kill her. Lisa Montgomery was pronounced dead on January 12, 2021, at 1.31 in the morning. She was the first woman to be executed by the federal government in 67 years, and one of 13 people executed by the time Trump left office. In her last statement to the press, Lisa's attorney, Kelly Henry, told BBC News the government stopped at nothing in its zeal to kill this damaged and delusional woman. Lisa Montgomery's execution was far from justice. As for Victoria Jo Stinnett, Bobby Joe's baby girl, she was raised by her loving father, Zeb. Zeb and Bobby Joe's families helped to raise Victoria Jo. They have been successful in keeping her out of the public eye. Victoria Joe will be 16 years old this year. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Murderish. Don't forget to follow or subscribe to my new podcast, Judgy and Juryish. Also, I'll be at CrimeCon in Austin, Texas this year, and I'd love to see you there. Use promo code MURDERISH20 to get 10% off of a standard badge. Go to CrimeCon.com to get info about the event. It's so much fun. Use promo code MURDERISH20 for 10% off. Stick around after the closing music to hear podcast promos for Murderific and Another Shade of Crime. Make sure you hit follow or subscribe if you like what you hear. Check out Murderish.com if you want to buy Murderish merch like t-shirts, face masks, and more. If you can't get enough of the show, subscribe to our Patreon service to get immediate access to bonus content only available to Murderish Patreon subscribers. There's a link to go behind the scenes and become a Patreon subscriber at Murderish.com. Thank you to Sharon D for becoming a Patreon subscriber. I really appreciate you. If you haven't joined the Murderish Facebook discussion group, do it. We have so much fun in there. You can also find me on Twitter at MurderishPod and on Instagram at MurderishPodcast. If you want to support the show in other ways, just tell a friend about the show or write Murderish a review in your favorite podcast app. Murderish is mixed and mastered by John and Jessica Buchanis of Audio Editing Solutions. Music is by Nico of We Talk of Dreams. This episode was researched and written by Allison Schwartz. Stick around after the music and podcast promos to hear a list of sources used for this episode. As always, Ishers, thank you for joining me on another episode of Murderish. And remember, listening to this podcast does not make you a murderer. It just means you're murder-ish. My 
name is Bernadette, the host of Murderific True Crime Podcast. Murder plus horrific equals murderific. I cover some cases from the state of Maine in the United States and all over the world. Mass murders, domestic abuse, unsolved cases, serial killers, and mostly lesser known subjects. We don't shy away from the details, but we do that with all respect. This isn't entertainment, these are real people's lives, and I'm here to tell their story. Join me for my season five reboot, and together we will be executing podcasts one crime at a time. How does a man survive 80 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit? What's the true story behind Hurricane Katrina? Why did nine-year-old Aisha Degree pack a bag in the middle of a stormy night and disappear? And how did serial killer Samuel Little kill 80 people without the police finding out? These are the stories you won't find on other podcasts. The stories that often go unnoticed. The victims that are lost to time. Writer-producer James Hayes, sound designer and co-producer Liam Fox O'Brien, and host Carl Ellis Grant will answer these questions in another shade of crime. A monthly true crime podcast about crimes committed by and against people of color. Because crime does not discriminate. Find us on iTunes, Spreaker, or anywhere podcasts are found. Sources for this episode include an Associated Press article in the Manhattan Mercury dated October 10th, 2007, an Associated Press article in the Spokesman Review dated October 27th, 2007, an Associated Press article in the Hayes Daily News dated December 21st, 2004, an article in the New York Daily News dated December 19th, 2004 by Nicole Bode and Tracy Connor. Information found at childwelfaremonitor.org dated December 23, 2020. A melvernkansas.com article dated 2014. An article at cnn.com dated December 22, 2004 by Jonathan Freed. An article in the Springfield News Leader dated October 10, 2007 by Heather Hollingsworth. An article in the Topeka Capital Journal dated January 10th, 2021 by Timothy Hrencher. An article in the Kansas City Star dated January 3rd, 2021. An article in the Springfield News Leader dated January 11th, 2021 by Harrison Keegan. An article in Rolling Stone dated January 22nd, 2021 by Hannah Murphy. An article in the Kansas City Star dated December 21st, 2004 by Kevin Murphy, David Klepper, and Tanyanika Samuels. An article in the St. Joseph News Press dated September 30, 2007, by Allison Rallitz. An article in the St. Joseph News Press dated October 25, 2007, by Allison Rallitz. An article in The Intercept dated January 10, 2021, by Liliana Segura. An article in the Houston Chronicle dated October 6, 2007, by Margaret Stafford. A Justia U.S. Law article dated September 22, 2010 at law.justia.com. An article in the New York Daily News dated December 19, 2004 by Alonzo Weston and Tracy Connor. An article in the U.S. Sun dated January 14, 2021 by Debbie White.